me. Um, and thank you for having me, Shifas, and uh, I, I should say Professor Zedi too. Um, so, you know, it's it's absolute honor to, to speak on this forum. Um, let me tell you a little bit. Um, can you see my, let me see if I can resume. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, oops, let me just go back to the first one. And really what, what I do is, um, as, as Sen said, is I'm an adult congenital cardiologist. And um, what that really means is that I take care of children who are really not children anymore, they're adults and who have grown up with congenital heart disease, all forms of congenital heart disease. And really what this talk is not about the granularity or the details of the lesions of congenital heart disease, but really a historical journey as to what this is. And people still don't quite know um, what adult congenital heart disease is. And, and in, in England and in Europe, it's really what's called grown-up congenital heart disease or GUCH or G-U-C-H. But that's sort of the flavor of this, this talk. I have no disclosures, but um, this is really what we'll do. We'll talk a little bit about the history. I'll sp spend just a few slides talking about outcomes and what that means um, and outcomes over, over the last 70 years. So it's not some, it's not something over the last four or five years, but really over the last 70 years as to why we, we're even having this conversation. I'll talk a little bit about transition of care, and that's really the sort of the spectrum or the fulcrum of movement of medicine um, or the care of children as they move from the world of pediatrics into the world of adult medicine, and that's called transition of care. And that in itself is a whole, um, it's a whole series of talks and webinars, but the transition is something that um, is important and then really what lies ahead in this field. So let's start with the beginnings of congenital heart disease. And those of you who've sort of heard me speak before, I always start here and I show this slide and this is, this is, this is Mona Lisa. It's not that, and I would say it's not that she has congenital heart disease, but really the, the journey and the journey doesn't really begin with da Vinci. I mean, if you think about it, it's congenital heart disease, you know, children are born with it. So if you go back to the beginnings of mankind, children were still being born with all forms of congenital heart disease. But why da Vinci? Well, da Vinci was interesting because he was not just a painter or an artist, but he was also back in the, back several hundred years ago was a, was a, uh, was an anatomist of sorts. He, he drew, as you can see, uh, vertebral columns and, but he actually drew the womb and in the womb, he drew the child. He drew, as I said, uh, many bones and on my, my, some of this might've been autopsy specimens, but what he also drew in, remarkably in a series of drawings was, and was were pictures of anomalous coronary arteries, uh, which is a form of congenital heart disease. And this is going back, as I said, many hundreds of years ago. If you go, to, if I take you to the 1600s, Neil Stenson in Denmark, and this was the first case which was published in 1671, which was an interventricular septal defect, which is now what's called a ventricular septal defect, RV outflow tract obstruction, which means the blood can't get out of the RV outflow. Um, there is a misaligned aorta, but this is what is now called tetralogy of Fallot. And this was first published in 1671. And what is fascinating about Stenson in, in the 1600s is that what you may know him for is not for the first congenital case that was published, was, was actually the Stenson's duct in the, in the oral cavity. So the Stenson's duct is really what he's known for. Um, so it's fascinating that he was a Danish scientist, but that's sort of the first published case. And that's the Stenson's duct that I just said. In the 1700s, uh, Matthew Bailey um, um, uh, talked about uh, the morbid anatomy of some of the most important parts of the human body. And this was his book. And I found it fascinating because it, the book is called The Morbid Anatomy of Some of the Most Important Parts of the... And in this, <coughs> excuse me, he, he mentions, he mentions uh, a transposition. So what that means is from the right ventricle, normally the pulmonary artery should arise, but he drew pictures um, of the aorta that was coming out of the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery that was um, coming out of the left ventricle. So what's called transposition of the great vessels of 1700s. Um, this was, I then show you Charles Dickens um, and why Charles Dickens. And I, I, again, when you go to the historical aspects of congenital heart disease, I mean, you sort of wonder why am I showing you Charles Dickens? Well, the reason is that in the 1800s, Charles Dickens was actually behind uh, the great Ormond Street Hospital in London when he was a financier, which means he was already thinking in the 1800s that children's hospitals needed to be created. 
So in the 1800s, there were really no dedicated children's hospitals. So even in cities like London and Philadelphia and Boston, which then became sort of the big landmark children's hospitals, um, it was really in the 1800s when these sort of facilities were being developed. And we look at these, these are small buildings. These are monstrous children's hospitals now, both all in London and Philadelphia, the children's hospital in Boston. But that was the first time that these uh, children's hospitals were being created. And the reason I show this uh, from the context of congenital heart disease is that the Great Ormond Street Hospital really became um, the landmark uh, clinic for congenital heart disease. And I'll show you that in just a second. But if I go take you further along in 1888 is really so where congenital heart disease starts now being published. And again, keep in mind, there is no treatment at this point. This is all either autopsy or children who are dying and they're uh, folks that are writing about it. This is Arthur Fallot, um, and he wrote this in France in 1888. And keep in mind, Stenson wrote this exactly 200 years ago, but, but no one ever sort of gave it much credence. But Fallot comes along 200 years later and describes Tetralogy of Fallot, which is the four anatomical characteristics, as I'd explained. And that's called Tetralogy of Fallot, and, and this, this was then published. I take you to this, the practice of medicine. So wearing my adult, adult medicine, adult cardiology hat on. So William Osler, he, he was a pioneer. He was, he, he's called a philosopher, uh, philosopher physician. Um, and if those of you ever get the chance of reading his works or his quotations, it's fascinating. He, in his book, The Principles and Practice of Medicine um, in 1897, he had a section on the circulatory system. And in the circulatory system, he had a five page chapter that he, de he devoted to the congenital afflictions of the heart. So even back in late 1800, someone like William Osler was writing about congenital heart disease um, in his textbook. I take you to this. This is uh, this is uh, this is sort of one of, one of the main uh, main book textbooks of, of of pediatrics, not congenital heart disease, but pediatrics. It's called the Disease of Infancy and Childhood. Again, in the late 1800s in New York, this is in New York Presbyterian, which is not so far from uh, where where I live now. Um, and in this uh, textbook of pediatrics was a seven-page chapter on the peculiarities of the heart and circulation in er early life. So again, sort of people are talking about congenital heart disease. They're right about congenital heart disease, and this is in the late 1800s. I take you to Theodore Billroth in Berlin, Germany, and some, some of you may know Bill Roth. Dr. Billroth is, is, was a surgeon with the Billroth operation, and he said, um, oops, he said um, in 1800s that a surgeon who tries to suture a heart wound deserves to lose the esteem of his colleagues. Performing an operation to the heart is tantamount to an act of surgical frivolity. So if you think about this, surgeons back then in the late 1800s, early 1900s, like don't go near the heart. It's not, a, it's not an organ to touch, stay away from it. And it's, it's frivolous. Um, so, so, so again, really, at, though people are talking about it, there's really nothing that's being done. So late 1800s, um, congenital heart disease is of limited interest. There is talk, there is some papers being written that books that have some chapters being written, but it's considered an ailment not compatible with life, which means these children die. Um, these children die, nothing, nothing can be done. So I take you to 1930s at Montreal, Canada, and this is Maura Abbott. This, is a, she, this story is fascinating from a historical standpoint. She was the first woman of congenital heart disease and women have played a tremendous role in congenital heart disease. Um, Mount Abbott in 1930s was in Canada, and she was, if you think about this, she was a pediatric cardiologist in Canada. At that time in 1936, she wrote this book called The Atlas of Congenital Cardiac Disease. So it was a series of autopsy specimens, a thousand cases, all post-mortem essentially. And when this book came out, she was actually told that she can't really practice as a pediatric cardiologist as, um, in the 30s, and she was told to retire. So she actually retired, and then she died four years later. Um, she was actually told that she should really be a pathologist, but, um, and she was, but anyway, I take you to 1939 to James Brown. This was the first sort of book that was being written on congenital heart disease. This is from London. Um, and, and I found this fascinating when you actually look through some of the chapters, and I'll read this to you, that, that these, are, these are blue babies. These are blue babies that are being born. Um, and they remain sheltered in their homes. They're incapable of any sustained activity. They're so incapacitated that some can't even walk. Many, but not all of them are underdeveloped. Some of them are retarded mentally. It's a word we don't use that much or shouldn't be using it uh, at this point in time, but they have not had the opportunities for education. 
And this is a really fascinating part of this is all are subjects of great affection from their parents. And it's peculiar to note that both parents usually accompany the child to the outpatient department. I say this, this was written in 1939. No operations are being done. No medicines are these blue babies, these children can gel heart disease in the 1930s, essentially dying. But those of them who are surviving are either cyanotic, but they come for clinic visits with their parents. And, I, and, and, and I'll tell you, I, I often tell people, even in my practice today um, here in New York at Sinai, um, it's, uh, we see patients coming in with their parents. My old, one of my older patients is, um, uh, is a 64 year old gentleman with tetralogy who's repaired. His mom is 92 and she comes with him even today to clinic. And she often tells me that she actually walks faster than he does. And I, I find it fascinating. So again, this was reported in 1939. So, so what does this mean from a surgical standpoint? Well, what, this is where the journey begins, is, is really the beginnings of cardiac surgery. And this is sort of um, the next few slides, I'll walk you through how, how sort of therapeutics and surgery comes in. It starts with the patent ductus arteriosus. This is a small blood vessel that connects the aorta, which is up here, to the pulmonary artery. Every child is born with a patent ductus arteriosus. But Robert Gross in, uh, in, in 1938 at the Boston Children's Hospital sort of took, took the first step and he basically said, I'm going to operate on the heart. Um, so he said, I'm going to operate on the patent ductus arteriosus. And this is the operation that is being done. This is the child. She was an older child. Um, uh, you can see a little bit of cyanosis around the lips. Um, and she was, had a patent ductus arteriosus that Robert, Robert Gross uh, took to the OR and operated and closed the duct. Remember, this is outside the heart. It's still a you're going through the chest. You're working on the PDA. You're ligating it, but you're not in the heart. What's fascinating historically from this standpoint is Robert Gross at that point was not the attending. He was not the consultant. He was actually a house officer. Um, and he did this when his attendings were not in the hospital. And he took, he, he took this, he was fired from, the, uh, from, his, from being a house officer in Boston Children's Hospital at Harvard. Um, and eventually when they found out what he had done and that this was successful, this is the patient who then lived on to be 80 years old. He was bought back, hired back, and he became the chief cardiothoracic surgeon of uh, Harvard. But this was the first landmark movement in congenital heart surgery. The same thing in 1938 was being done in Dusseldorf, Germany. Uh, same operation was done in essentially the same year, but no records were kept because they were burnt in a fire. So never, this never really made it to the limelight. I take you to 1944 in Sweden, and this is Clarence Crawford. Clarence Crawford is, was a surgeon who worked on the coarctation. And coarctation is a narrowing that's distal to the left subclavian artery. It's in the aorta, it narrows down here. And what he did was he operated and he fixed the coarctation. And this is then again, outside. So you're in the chest, but you're not in the heart. So you fix coarctation. The landmark surgery was again tetralogy of fallow. It was in November 1944, and these three people are sort of the hall, the, hall, the sort of the flag bearers of congenital heart surgery. And this is Alfred Blaylock on the left. He was a, a, a professor of cardiothoracic surgery at Hopkins. This is in Baltimore. This is Helen Tausig, who was a pediatric cardiologist in the 1940s in Baltimore. And this is Vivian Thomas. It's a fascinating story. Those of you ever, there's a movie called Something the Lord Made. If you guys ever have the time to watch it, I would suggest you take time and watch it. The, the story here is that Vivian Thomas was actually a carpenter and he was in Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. And the history is that he was working for Blaylock in his lab and they were actually working on dog models. And they were trying to figure out how they could create shunts from the pulmonary artery, uh, from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. And eventually when Blaylock moved to Hopkins, he convinced Vivian Thomas, who was a carpenter, he was not a medical per person. He said, come with me, we'll go to Baltimore, go to Hopkins. He goes to Hopkins, meets Helen Tausig, who at that point was actually working with these blue babies and saying, well, we need to do something. And she had concepts and she had ideas. And the three of them came together and eventually came up with what was called the blaylock Tausig operation. What this really means here, oops, let me go back is here is in tetralogy, you can't get blood because of tetralogy of Polo from this is the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery. Um, and you can't get blood here because there is stenosis. And what they basically said was uh, Vivian Thomas, Blaylock and, um, and um, Helen Tausig said, well, if you take the subclavian artery and turn it down into the pulmonary artery, then you will have blood going through the aorta, through the subclavian artery, and then come down to the pulmonary artery. So this way you will feed blood into the pulmonary arteries, even though no blood is entering through the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery. So these babies were cyanotic, 
because blood couldn't get into the pulmonary artery. But through this shunt, through the surgical shunt, you could sort of then say that we can uh, we can get blood into in, into the lungs. And this was a landmark surgery. We still do this operation. Um, this hasn't changed. Uh, it has been modified into a classic uh, from a classic to a modified. But here's the fascinating part of this is that this is the actual surgery. This is the, the cartoon or the diagram that was drawn. This is the sternotomy. This is the patient. This is the patient that's lying down. This is Eileen Saxon, the baby that was done. But here's the fascinating part. This is Blaylock who's doing the operation. And he actually called Vivian Thomas, who was the carpenter who was working in his, in his lab that come into the OR. And Vivian Thomas was the one who had developed the shunt in dog models. And he's the one who had the hands, the finesse, but he wasn't allowed to operate because he was he was a carpenter. He was in the lab. Surgeon was Blaylock, was Alfred Blaylock. So he was telling Blaylock throughout the operation and walking him through it as to how the operation should be done. And that's how this operation was done. Um, unfortunate part of this is that the shunt is called the BT shunt, Blaylock uh, uh, Tausig shunt. Blaylock for the surgeon, Tausig for the pediatric cardiologist, and Vivian Thomas's name never made it into the shunt, even though it was. And over the last maybe 20 or 30 years, there's been a movement that we should really call it the BTT shunt, which is the Blaylock Tausig Ta Thomas shunt. But again, this is history. What's also fascinating about this historical operation is that um, Merrill Harmel, um, who was um, uh, did the operation, but the, but what's really interesting is is that he was the junior anesthesiologist. The the chief of anesthesiology at that point at Hopkins basically refused to operate, and he told Blaylock, "I'm not going to do this because I will not put this child to death. I'm not going to do this operation." So Blaylock then had to get the junior anesthesiologist, and this became the landmark surgery at that point in time. The reason I'm showing you this is, uh, is an operative report that was dictated by Blaylock. I got my hands on this, and this was actually fascinating. When you actually read through this, and I know it's not a very, very nice copy, but let me read this. What it says is the patient stood the procedure better than I had anticipated. It is interesting that the cyanosis did not appear again, and he was actually not very confident that he was going to be able to do this in a, in a child. So he go, went in thinking that this may not work, but it actually did. And this is the cartoon again of the subclavian artery that's being turned down. This became, this hit the news um, in the United States in the 1940s that now there was an operation that blew babies that who were dying until the 1940s could be saved. This was the Twitter, this was the Instagram of the 1940s, and this, this is just showing you that it sort of hit the limelight. But what happened, uh, uh, again, is fascinating from a historical standpoint, in that in the 1940s, over the next five or 10 years, there were many thousands and thousands of BT shunts. Uh, but people were still not inside the heart. And the question really remained that can you in the 1940s get into the heart? I'm gonna show you um, what I thought was fascinating also historically is that in the 1940s, there were many things that were happening. You know, there was baseball that was being developed. There was Gandhi, there was, um, uh, there, there, there was independence, uh, uh, independences across the, across the world that was happening. But in, there's no mention of, of congenital heart disease, surgical success, which, which again, in, you know, again, it was net, not felt to be sort of earth shattering at that point in time. But but there's no mention of congenital heart disease at surgery. So the question then came in the 1940s and in the 1950s is that can you get into the heart? So you can get into the chest and you can sort of do the great vessel surgeries, but can you get into the heart? Can you actually open the heart and get onto the heart? And that's the concept of what was called the heart-lung machine, or what's now called the cardiopulmonary bypass apparatus. And this started in the 1950s, but but what was fascinating about this, again, historically, as this was developed in Boston by John and Mary Gibbons, is, is, is this is their actual cardiopulmonary machine that was being done. And his first operation inside the heart, so you're opening the chest, you're opening the heart, was an ASD, an atrial septal defect, again, a congenital case that was done in a young woman by, uh, by John Gibbon. And this was, um, this was successful at that point in time on a heart-lung bypass operation. But his next five patients died on the cardiopulmonary machine. And he said, I'm not doing this anymore. Can't kill patients. We're going to put a moratorium on this. And he shut the machine down. He basically shut that whole operation. He said, I'm not doing cardiopulmonary bypass. 
So I'm going to then take you into the late 1950s to Walton Lillehei in Minnesota. This was a cardiothoracic surgeon who was at the University of Minnesota. And this was also fascinating sort of major movement in congenital heart disease surgery is um, what Walton Lillehei said is that, well, I understand that, 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 you know, Gibbons has put a moratorium on this, but we're going to take this and we're going to do um, an open heart repair on a tetralogy patient. This was an older chuck child, excuse me. Um, and he basically said, we're going to use cross circulation uh, to oxygenate the patient's blood. Um, and this is a very interesting concept because this was an older child. And watch what I'm going to show you next is that this is the operation that is being done uh, by Lillehei. But what, you, what you'll also see on this is there's a second operating table and there's another patient being done here simultaneously. So the patient's being operated, the chest is open, but there is a second patient here and they're working on it. And what this is with the concept of cross circulation is and what Lillehei did was he basically said, here's the patient, we're gonna take the blood, we're gonna circulate it and we're gonna pump it through the patient's father. So the pump, so the oxygenation and the cross circulation is gonna go through the apparatus, through the dad and then back into the child. And this was cross circulation. So if you just stop and think about this for a second is that this was a landmark surgery, absolutely landmark surgery and this patient survived and eventually unfortunately the patient died from a pneumonia down the road. But the point was that he took cross circulation into context. And when he did this operation, he quoted a 200% mortality. So those of you who are surgeons in the room and listening, think about that for a second. You, I mean, if you quote, if you quote 100% mortality risk to a patient, that's one thing, but you're quoting a 200%. So which means child and dad both could have died, but in this situation, they both, both died. So that's patient pump cross circulation through, through the dad. I'm gonna take you to the 1950s. This is, um, this is transposition. This is right ventricle to the aorta, LV to the pulmonary artery. And this is Dr. Senning. And he came up with what is called the transposition, uh, uh, the Senning operation. And then in the 60s, that was developed by Mustard. And what that really means is that now the right ventricle is pumping blood to the aorta and the left ventricle is pumping blood to the pulmonary artery. That's not survivable. They can't survive with that. So they took the atrium and they route, they basically routed all the venous blood over. So the, so the vena cava blood was going one way and the pulmonary vein blood was coming the other way. So this is called an atrial switch operation. It was done in the 60s. Uh, and this sort of stood the, uh, stood the test of time. In the 1960s was the first time that the concept of Apologize, was, was the concept of uh, balloon atrial septostomy. Oops, sorry, I lost. Uh, was balloon atrial septostomy. And what this means is that this was the first time that cardiac catheterization or interventional cardiac catheterizations was coming into play. Until now, if you think about it, it's all operations. Nobody's doing interventional um, uh, cardiac catheterization. At this time, this is in the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And Bill Rashkin said, well, let's try to palliate these kids. And he put a catheter through into the child with transposition. Um, and he actually created a hole in the atrial septum and he allowed mixing of blood. So blue and red blood was mixing and mixed blood was getting out into the pulmonary artery and the aorta. And this was the first time that interventional catheterization was used to palliate. And since the 1960s and in the 60s and 70s, then multiple different sort of forms of interventional card cardiac catheterizations came around. These are small plugs back in the 60s they are much more sophisticated now, but just historically, this was really in the 60s where this came around. In the 70s, this is single ventricles. This is a very complex congenital heart disease. This is again in Paris. This is tricuspid atresia, which means the tricuspid valve is atretic. So the blue blood that's coming into the heart cannot get into the right ventricle. Um, so that's not compatible with light. As Francis Fontaine was a surgeon in Paris, and what he said was that we'll take the blue blood, hook up the atrium directly into the left pulmonary artery, we'll ligate the SVC that's coming down into the heart, and then we'll anastomose that to the right pulmonary artery. So all your head and neck blue blood is coming down the SVC, doesn't enter the heart, goes into the right lung, all your IVC flow or from the bottom, from the from the from the belly and the legs comes into the heart, goes in the left pulmonary artery, oxygenates, come back into the come back, uh, returns to the to the heart, and then goes out into aorta. So now you have single ventricle palliation, and this was the first time this happened in the 1970s. Very complex congenital heart disease. 
1975, take you to Brazil. Again, transposition, RV, giving rise to the aorta. And this is Adib Jetin. He was, he was a surgeon in Brazil. And what he said was, well, why are we doing this complex atrial surgery where really what we need to be doing is, is, oops, is transecting above the aorta. So this is the right ventricle into the aorta. This is the left ventricle into the pulmonary arteries. It should be the other way around. And he basically said, let's transect above the great vessels and do what's called a switch. So move these two great vessels, this one to here, this one to here. But the problem here was that in these babies, the coronary arteries are coming from these small areas and this has to be moved over too. So very complex, very minute, very finesse surgery, but this again changed the shape of congenital heart disease surgery. In the late seventies comes prostaglandins. This is a medicine. For the first time, you're talking about medicines and this sort of keeps the patent ductus arteriosus open. So in cyanotic or blue babies, this changed the flavor again of congenital heart disease. Now we can use medicines instead of surgery or catheterizations to palliate babies, babies who were born with cyanotic congenital heart disease. I'm gonna jump to about 20 years and come to London, uh, to initially Paris and then to London where Philip Bonhoeffer came up with the transcatheter valve. And this is called the melody valve. It's taken from the jugular vein of a cow. And what he came up with was a, was a, trans, was a prosthetic valve. And in the valve, he basically said that we can take the vein, create a valve, and through a catheter, do transcatheter valve emplacements, uh, placements. And this was the first time that was done in the in 1920s, sorry, in the early two, uh, 2000s. And this again, since then, transcatheter valves has really changed the flavor. So let me now talk a little bit about conge adult congenital heart disease. What I've just done is taken you over about a 300 year journey of sort of where, how congenital heart disease was being talked about. It was essentially all kids who were dying. But why adult congenital heart disease? So let me wear my ACHD hat on for a second. And the first time someone talked about adult congenital heart disease on a national forum was Lady Jane Somerville. And this was at the Heart Hospital at the Brompton. Um, and those of you who are in London may, may know about this. And so J Jane Summerlin in 1975 said this, her words were, this will be a tsunami that will hit in about 20 years because these kids will start surviving. In England, uh, sorry, in America, it was at UCLA was James Joseph Burloff. And this was the first ACHD pro not program, I shouldn't say program, was clinic that was established. So if you think about it, we're going back 45 years ago, that's when people started talking about adult congenital heart disease um, as a field that will, will grow. So what are the outcomes? Well, let's look at the outcomes. And I just wanna give you some perspective on this is that remember surgery started in the forties that it was outside the heart, then the tetralogy, then so we started getting into the heart and now that has finessed. But the reason why outcomes are important to understand is that the, initially the outcomes were just taking these children, these babies and surviving to one year of age, get them to one year. Then it was, let's just get them to childhood. Then it was, let's get them to normal adolescence. But now 97% of these children survive to adulthood. And keep in mind, it is the most common birth defect. It is 40,000 infants born with congenital heart disease. It's way more common than can childhood cancers or cystic fibrosis or any other stuff. It is the most common congenital heart defect. This is just data showing you through decades. This blue circle is pediatric uh, or, or children with congenital heart disease in the United States in 1965. Watch the circle. These are ch uh, adults with congenital heart disease. In 1985, it balances out, which means children are now surviving to adulthood. And over the last 15 years or so, there are now more adults with congenital heart disease than there are children with congenital heart disease. So if you just stop and pause for a second in, in the United States, and I'll get into the de de developing world in just a second, there are more adults with congenital heart disease. This is the same for Europe. This is the same for, for England. So adulthood, reaching adulthood is now expected. So what does it mean in my world? Well, this is what it means in my world uh, is that these adults, these young children are not children anymore. They're adults. So they're in their twenties and thirties and forties. And as I just said, I follow children, adults in their sixties and seventies, but they have many cardiac and non-cardiac complications. They can have heart failures and arrhythmias. They can have a lot of pulmonary hypertension, they can have valvular disease. Uh, there's a lot of psychological effects there too, the residual shunts, but certainly an arrhythmia is, it's a, is a big part of this. So these are the long-term complications. Let me here talk a little bit about transition. I'm gonna sort of switch gears a little bit because what I've just shown you is how the field evolved from being sort of within pediatric cardiology to now being its own world. 
Well, transition is what we just went through, what I just described. Transition basically means when your child, and those of you who are, who are maybe pediatricians or deal with children, when your child outgrows pediatric care, that's what transition is. And what that means is that transition is important because if we don't recognize that these children chronic illnesses need a home when they get into their 20s and 30s, these patients will drop out, they will lose care, and there's morbidity and mortality that's associated with it. This is just an example of, of a case. It's a 32-year-old with a single ventricle. Um, and just, again, very complex heart. And the, the, I, I won't get into the nitty gritties of this, but this, most people should have two ventricles. This patient has one ventricle. This is going to the aorta. This was a dysfunctional ventricle. This patient was 32 years old, was lost to follow up, got sick, showed up in a children's emergency room, was admitted. Um, this is a blood clot that's sitting inside the fontan, which again, I won't get into, but this is a very large thrombus or a blood clot that's sitting. And this patient was eventually listed for a heart transplant. The point being that there was no transition of care. This patient just showed up in the ER. This is from the American Academy of uh, Pediatrics. And what it says is, this is sort of across the board, across the world, and quite honestly, is the goal of transition is to provide uninterrupted health care that is patient-centered, age developmentally appropriate, flexible, and comprehensive. And that's really the concept of healthcare, not just transition, but that's really what's needed. So what we're doing is we're going from this to this. So these kid, children are actually moving into the adult world. Uh, they're not children anymore, so they're moving to the adult world. And this is sort of my world where you're bridging two systems. You're sort of bridging a pediatric system. You're trying to get these young adults or even older adults into sort of an adult driven system. And that's where the bridge comes in. And that's adult congenital heart disease. So it's no longer a childhood illness. Again, I'm gonna switch gears and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about pregnancy. I put these slides in just this morning. I wasn't gonna talk about this, but I figured it's probably something to touch, touch upon is because as 97% of these children are surviving, they are surviving with women with congenital heart disease. So there are many women, in the, young women in the 20s and 30s, and even in the 40s who wanna get pregnant, they wanna have children. So when pregnancy comes into adult congenital heart disease, and I won't get into the granularity of this, this is just to show you that it can become a risk stratification. These patients can have shunts and they can even have pulmonary hypertension, they can have a right heart or left heart dysfunction. And in my world, again, it becomes a risk stratification, which means you take from no heart disease all the way to Eisenmenger syndrome. And during pregnancy, any woman who doesn't, doesn't even have congenital heart disease, any woman out there, there are trimesters, there's motor disease, there's postpartum, and there is changes in hemodynamics, which is in the heart and in the lungs. There are hemodynamic changes that are happening. Throw adult congenital heart disease in there. So let's say now you have a Fontan, a single ventricle, a transposition, or a valvular heart condition. And each trimester, the risk will change. So this is something important to remember. To show you one case real quick, this is a 34-year-old when I was a fellow many years ago. Um, and this patient showed up with systemic hypertension, was sort of lost to follow up. Uh, the right arm blood pressure is 216. Um, so it's clearly very, very hypertensive. It was placed on labetalol. We did an MRI and a CT. What we found here was a severe coarctation. So this is a subclavian artery. These are collaterals. This is complete narrowing of the aorta. That's the, this sort of the that's subclavian artery. We screened, uh, we made plans. We decided that we're probably gonna go for a C-section or what's called an assisted stage two. We were worried about the aortic instability. We were worried about the blood pressure. She went on labetalol, um, very high dosages. Um, she then developed congestive heart failure. She wanted to carry the pregnancy. These are always difficult discussions to have with the mother. Um, she was eventually taken to the children's hospital and these services were involved, ICU, interventional cat, cardiothoracic surgery, high-risk anesthesia, adult congenital, obstetrics, and unitology, um, all these different services. And then eventually we decided we were gonna take to the lab and put what's called a covered stent. And this is in the lab. This is in the children's cardiac catheterization lab. The permission that were taken, these are from my mentors back then when I was a fellow. And this is the patient being draped. Um, this is a high-risk OB team. This is, this, this is um, John Cheatham, who was one of my mentors. And this is Mark Lanowitz, who was a surgeon. They all came in. This is the NICU team. This is the, the, this is the NICU team ready to deliver because the patient had to be delivered. This is the severe coarctation. There's a catheter going across and then a covered stent was placed. But this is in the, everything goes fine. But an hour later, there's fetal heart decelerations and the patient is actually delivered on the cath table 
um, with a crash C-section and the baby was taken, was delivered and, and taken to the ICU. I'm not saying this is standard of care. I'm not saying this should be done, but I'm just telling you that the, this is what happens um, in when patients are lost to follow up and transition doesn't happen. They sort of fall through the cracks um, and they show up pregnant or, 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 or sick or need a heart transplant. Um, a month later, the patient was doing fine. The concept is it's multidisciplinary. This cannot be done isolated. I cannot do this alone. Nobody can do this alone. This is, this is a multidisciplinary approach where many, many, many different fields are involved. So what lies ahead, I'm gonna finish here in about six minutes or five minutes, is this is innovations. Innovation is the key in any field, innovation is the key. It's research, it's development, it's concepts, it's inventions, it's improvement, it's quality, it's all those things. This is fascinating because this is something that I've been talking about for 10 years is that right now we're doing transcatheter valves and it's sort of one size valve fits all. But as we speak, if you believe this, just yesterday, this was approved. This is a device which is basically RV outflow tracts, which, which means every single one of you who's listening has a different heart, has a different morphological specimen of the right ventricle or the RV outflow tract. So what we can do now is that we can take a CT, a, a, a CT model of the heart, create a valve that is unique to each one of you, and then deploy that to a catheter. And this is actually called the Harmony valve. And as I said, it got approved yesterday in the United States. It is now FDA approved. So this is a major, major step forward. So in my historical slides, I'll be adding that in the future. These are leadless pacemakers um, that are now being used, especially in the world of adult congenital heart disease when people have had multiple pacemakers or they've had multiple operations. We try to avoid putting leads into the heart. Um, so, um, and the subcutaneous ICDs. This is just to show you that imaging, innovation imaging. So what used to be just echo now, we can move over to what's called 3D printing. We can print the heart. We can actually create a wall out of the heart and we can show the surgeons exactly where the vessels are coming out and what sits inside the heart. So if they ever need to cannulate or operate, we can show what's outside, but we can actually show inside. There's now virtual re reality that's coming in. This is MRI showing you exact flow metrics. Again, I won't get into the granularity of this, but this is a Fontan. This is the IVC flow that's coming in. This is SVC flow coming down. None of this flow enters the heart, it goes directly into the lung. So this is just showing you that MRI innovations is happening. I'm going to just show you a couple of things and I'll, I'll, I'll stop in a second is how the field has evolved. So remember, I took you from a couple of hundred years ago to 2008. The reason I'm showing you the next few slides is that there were no guidelines for adult congenital management, at least in, in even in developed countries. In 2008 was the first time guidelines came out from the American College of Cardiology. These were revised in 2018. So again, if you think about it, everything that I just said, really sort of mad clinical management of patients with congenital heart disease, the guidelines really came out over the last 10 years, just in the last 10 years. What about fellowship training? And just to show you where the field is going is that um, it is now 24 years in the United States, which means that you have to do either internal medicine or pediatrics. You can then do adult cardiology or pediatric cardiology. And then you have to do another two years of dedicated training in adult congenital heart disease. This then leads to board certification. You can't now just put up a board saying that a sign saying I'm an ACHD doc which basically means that there is now certifications. This was started in 2015. And over the last couple of years in the United States, again, is a broad process of program accreditation, which basically means that you now cannot just put up a sign saying, I'm an ACHD physician, I have a program. You actually have to go through national accreditation, which means you have to bridge that gap. You have to bridge the gap between adult cardiology and pediatric cardiology, and then pick in children's hospitals what is best done. So the congenital cardiothoracic surgeons are the best surgeons to think about. But these patients, as I said, are now in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. They need internal medicine. They need pregnancy. They need OB. So how are you going to bridge the gap? And that's really what it is. Adult congenital truly is the bridge between pediatrics and, uh, and adult medicine. So this started in 2016. I'm going to bring this and end this with the developing world. I mean, what I've showed you now over the last 
sort of 40 minutes is what's happened in the developing world. But in the developing world, this is a major, major issue. So if you look here, this is population in millions per ACHD center. So, so if you even in the developed world in North America, in, in, in parts of Europe, in England and Australia, even here, there are very few dedicated ACHD centers or programs or physicians who are trained in this subspecialty. But if you look at the rest of the pink and the red is the rest of the world. So there is a complete dearth. Uh, and this is something that needs to be de uh, developed. So what is needed is really advocacy and resources. And this is a very, very difficult uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 topic to broach because this is resources are limited in parts of the world. Um, but this is something that we've um, uh, those of you who've heard me speak, I'm, I, you know, we're we're trying to develop this. In I mean, my background is I'm from Pakistan, and um, in Pakistan we're trying to develop this. So there are very few centers, and there is a we're trying to build a children's hospital in Lahore that is dedicated to this. Um, but but it's not easy because when it comes to resources in 2021, as we speak. So if you think about everything that I've shown you, these are the resources that are needed for to to make sure these children a survive and they get into adulthood, and then they. Go so again, as I said, the concept is not getting them to 20s or 30s, we want to get them to 80s, you know, that's really where we need to take them. But these are the resources, and I, I won't again get into the granularity of each one of them, but they're multiple, multiple resources. So, as Martin Luther King said, if you can't fly, then run, if you can't run, then walk, if you can't walk, then crawl, but you've got to keep moving forward, and that is really where we are today. So, let me just end this by saying this is what I've done, but I end with Joe Perloff's quote that congenital heart disease in adults is really the future of children with congenital heart disease. And that's um, that's where I'll end. So should I'm gonna give, give this back to you, I'll, I'll, I'll stop to share. What a wonderful talk, fascinating. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zaidi, especially for me, having worked at the Royal Brompton and met and been in meetings with Jane Somerville, who's the mother of adult congenital heart disease, as you, as you said. Um, I'll just, if you don't mind, we'll have some questions, Dr. Zed, a few from the audience and, and one from my uh, myself as well. The, you touched on the economically less developed countries and how can we, we, we see a lot of these patients in those countries, and um, but how can we envisage making these treatments cost effective and reach those populations and those areas where they've limited access to medical facilities? Right. So, so Sam, that's... Um... Um, so that's a, that's a very difficult question, and and you, it's it's much needed. Um, uh, so I'll tell you only because I've been working with um, facilities in Pakistan in the, in the developing world. It's difficult because, as I said, if you think about what I just showed you, even in developed countries, the field has evolved really in the last sixty years, right? So if you think mm -hmm. about it, the data was that in the nineteen thirties or forties or even the fifties, these children were dying. So. Yes. You take so in the where you are in England and where I am in the North America, it's it, you know it's taken us almost seventy years to get to a stage where we can now say that ninety seven percent of these children will survive. So in the developing world, those resources are few and far between. So if I take Pakistan for instance, and again I don't know the rest of the world as well. I know India a little bit only because I've been working with some places there. There are a few things that we need to establish first. First is we need to establish dedicate, dedicated facilities. Right now, there are no dedicated facilities. Again, I'll speak so more for Pakistan and India as a, and maybe other parts of the world. What that means is we need surgeons, we need physicians who are trained in this, who are dedicated in this. We need not just that, we need institutions who are then going to bring the resources, which means operative care, uh, post-surgical care, long-term ICU care, so tremendous amount of resources. Which then brings the, what what, that, what what it comes down to then is funding, um, and just sort of wearing my administrative hat on and having worked with administrators now for the last fifteen years is that funding becomes a problem. So in developing worlds, um, Hussein, it's it's more challenging, Have, and I'll and end this with just this saying that um, uh, is that. For, I'll just take again Pakistan for an example. I don't want to comment on other countries because I don't know them that well. In Pakistan right now, there are really just two or three centers or maybe four centers that have some success with congenital heart disease. And again, the reason is resources. If you believe this, there are only seven surgeons 
in pa all of Pakistan who have any sort of semblance for congenital heart disease surgical training. So, so very few resources, very difficult question. Sorry, mm. and I didn't give you a very sophisticated answer, did I? No, so, I think that's a, it's a, it's a, a field that needs um, more input in those countries, as you said, because there's a lot of congenital heart disease yeah. there in pediatrics and, and adults. Um, there's another interesting question, uh, which is topical right now about COVID and your patients with adult congenital heart disease and uh, what we should tell these patients about their risk from COVID. Are they at higher risk or much higher risk? Should they be shielding? Fantastic question. So this is this is actually a very, very, a very apt question. So last year when the COVID pandemic was hitting, we actually didn't know what would happen to congenital heart disease patients who got COVID. And this year, about a year later, there's actually a very large study. There's one that's come from Europe. It's actually in the European Heart Journal. And there's another study that's coming out in the Journal of, uh, of JAK or the Journal of American Culture of Cardiology. And what they have shown is that about five or 600 patients at the cohort was not substantial, um, but all forms. So from mild adult, so mild lesions being ASDs or VSDs or small holes in the heart to very complex congenital heart disease like Fontans or transpositions or coax, patients actually did okay. Uh, so, so when you did a, what's called, a, so, so I'll put a little bit of my research hat on, it's like when you did a multivariate analysis, what it showed was that the congenital heart disease was not an individual, was not an isolated variable, was not a risk factor uh, that was associated with um, adverse outcomes being death, um, strokes, or hospitalizations. But what they showed was that the, in multivariate analysis that patients with adult congenital heart disease that who had diabetes, were obese, were hypertensive or had heart failure, um, those were the patients who had more adverse outcomes. So if I flip it by saying, in essence, what it means is that it's, it's the same risk factors that anybody else would have had um, that would have had adverse outcomes. So in isolation, congenital heart disease didn't, didn't sort of link up. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, excellent. Thank you. Um, and Ali, what about, uh, you told us about the patients from, who survived from childhood to adult and uh, the excellent progress that's been made over the last, um, well, last few decades. But um, there's a question about the quality of life of those patients and how much they can lead a normal life in adulthood, including things like pregnancy and what other precautions they need to take once they are in adults, uh, uh, in adulthood. So great question. So, so I'll answer that in two ways. One is, um, one is that in this day and age, again, in developed countries, so if I look at Europe or in, in the US, as I said, 95 to 97% of children survive into adulthood. All right, so that's the first thing. Survival is now, so if kids don't survive or, some, or something happens, that's a problem, right? So that's, let, let's pretend that they're all, 97% are surviving, they're adults. Your question was, and it's a very apt question, is quality of life. So I'll tell you this is that where that's where sort of we come in as ACHD specialists is that we actually are able to get them to a very good quality on a very good quality of life uh, on several metrics, which means it, with the right treatments, with the right interventions when we need to, we can actually get them to a fairly normal quality of life from a from purely from a uh, cardiovascular standpoint. So if you what then what that means is we can move the heart forward with the interventions at the right time and whatever else is needed. So that part, we're not that worried about. Well, what we see as physicians um, in the field is that, again, I think some of this is linked to transition is that these patients actually, when they get into their twenties and thirties, some of them still have a lot of, uh, not a lot, but they, they do struggle from a psychological standpoint. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, some of them do. So there is what we've noticed, and there's a lot of data for this is that they live with an underlying sense of anxiety yeah. um, because they never know what's going to happen is, you know, let's say if they have an ICD, is the ICD going to fire? Um, or if they have a pacemaker, will the pacemaker fail or things along those lines? So we, we see a lot of um, that anxiety in them. Not, again, that's not pervasive, don't get me wrong. It's in a small subsect. Um, so the answer to your question is that we can get them to a good quality of life from a cardiovascular standpoint but we also have to work on it from a psychosocial, from a psychological standpoint, because um, the, the other thing you said was pregnancy. And I'll tell you, the data for pregnancy and adult congenital heart disease is actually very good. Mm -hmm. So these young women in their 20s and 30s, when they get pregnant, they actually have very good outcomes. Um, but it has to be done multidisciplinary, which means we need to get high-risk OB, 
high risk anesthesia and ACHD all involved so that they're all talking to each other as we deliver them. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're, listen, it's an, it's, it's, it's an evolving field and certainly lots of things that are still being done. Thank you. There, there's a question about awareness and education programs for the public and, and that's quite important for um, the community and <clears throat> young mothers with young children. Um, but are there awareness and education programs in the developed world and in the developing world? Right. So, so there are. I mean, so, so both places there are. So, I'll, I'll first answer that education awareness on, on, on in, um, in the developed world. So, there are organizations, um, and if you believe this, there are lots of professional organizations. So, there are like the American Heart Association or the Adult Congenital Heart Association, the ACC, that have sort of wings within them, which are, um, which are, um, which are uh, promoting awareness and education. So, they're, they're, that's happening. But what's really happening in the in the developed world is patient-run organizations where patients are actually taking on advocacy, awareness, and education on their end. And that to me is really the impetus that takes it forward that the patients take onus. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who actually say that awareness needs to be spread. Um, and that and so the Adult Congenital Heart Association, for instance, it was initially run, started off as a patient-run organization, and it is now a full-fledged organization with many different people involved. So, so that's in the developed world. It's also in Europe, uh, in England, that's happening as well. In the developing world, it is more challenging. I will tell you that it's more challenging. I've been working with the Park Central Children's Heart Foundation, um, and we are talking a lot about awareness in, in the developing worlds. And I can't speak for Iran or Iraq or uh, or other developing countries, and I'd love to hear from them if what their thoughts there are. But, but, but in, in awareness in Pakistan or in develop, and I just you again, I'm just using Pakistan as an example, is much more challenging. And the reason is, and I'll tell you why, is because in developing countries, adult or congenital heart disease, if I just wear my pediatric hat on, is certainly something that's a problem. These children die, nobody even blinks an eye. The reason is, if, is these children die in infancy. So they, if you believe this, we often hear that, oh, the child turned blue and the child blew, that child turned blue and died. Well, the child doesn't turn blue and die randomly. I mean, there was some sort of congenital heart defect or some, maybe that was there. And that awareness is just not there. It is sort of just assumed that a child died. Oh, this must be, you know, that's what it was. And that's where we have to sort of, um, work on but but again you know there are in organizations and societies um that are there so yeah but it, 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 it is it is we're working on it it's very challenging um and um i think just because of time this will be the final question there's still a lot of questions and apologies to those we couldn't ask the questions uh that were asked uh, um that were asked in the um the attendees but the final question an interesting one is the prevalence of achd increasing due to our current lifestyle and the modern lifestyle or environmental shifts or certain geographical shifts? Um, say that again, I didn't quite grasp that. The, uh, the question was, is the prevalence of ACHD increasing due to our modern lifestyle um, changes or environmental shifts? So it's a good question. Um, so if you look about, if you think about it, it's, it's really an incidence question, not so much a prevalence question. And the incidence is 1%. So what that means is that if there's a child, if there are 100 children that are born with congenital heart disease, uh, one child, uh, so 100, 100 children that are born normally, anywhere in the world, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. One child will have congenital heart disease. All right, so 1%, right? That's, that's, that's across the board. So one in 100 will have congenital heart disease. So if you think about all the babies that are born all across the world, that's not a small number, which is why it is the most prevalent congenital defect. Now, is it changing because of our lifestyle? We don't have the evidence for that. I don't think there is any sort of data that I'm aware of. What I will tell you is that there is, if a child has congenital heart disease and that child becomes an adult, and then that child has a child, um, then there is some sort of increased risk of sort of transmission, which basically means, and the risk of transmission is not high, it's about three to 5%. Um, so, so, so what I'm saying is that can, the incidence is not gonna change. It's not gonna change, at least from what we can tell. Will our, could it change in the future because of a lifestyle? That's a great question. I think we need, we need, we'll have to do some research on it.
Fantastic. Well, I'm going to hand over to Sister Shipper, but I personally want to thank Dr. Zaidi for a, a fascinating, wonderful uh, talk today. Thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. I, I, I apologize if it was a little granular, but I was trying to keep it non-granular. No, it was wonderful. And we're so fortunate to have had you and we hope to have you back again very, very soon. Okay. I'm going to, yep. Thank you so much for, uh, thank, thanks so much. Thank you. And so before I let everyone go, I just wanted to share um, some upcoming events since there are uh, quite a few that SIVU will be um, having in the coming uh, days and weeks. So starting off is one that we're hosting in just about an hour from now about PG opportunities in the UK featuring Dr. Mariam Kazim Datu. And what I'll do is I'll share the link to register for that event in the chat now. Um, and then I also wanted to share with everyone a special event happening tomorrow um, in collaboration with IMI headquarters, IMI EU, um, and Sadiq International University. IMI UK presents healthcare professionals in the digital world and moderated by our own Dean uh, of SIVU, Dr. Hussein Shabi and Dr. Madassar Ahmed, the president of IMI UK. Um, and it's sure to be a very, a very um, exciting event with speakers from all around the world. Um, including the US and the UK. Um, and then finally, I also were, I'm very excited to be um, sharing with you the final program for our um, e-Congress happening at the beginning of April. Uh, I'll just share that with you here. Um, so Asadik International Virtual University presents international conferences in medical education. Our e-conferences, um, starting off with the, the University of Karbala College of Medicine um, and Sadiq International University starts um, Monday, April 5th, then Tuesday, April 6th, 7th and 8th. We're, we're working with ERA University in Lucknow um, to present virtual international conference for health professionals edu professions education. And then rounding off the week with a, uh, Friday, April 9th with the American University of Barbados um, for the global conference for health professional educators so i will also link that in the chat and you know we would love to have all of you there it's sure to be a great event and um and uh and with that uh we hope that you enjoyed today's um presentation and we'll, we'll see you again next time <laughs>